Bonne soirée. Bonne soirée. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm, I have the privilege of starting to ask the questions to Roger, and then we'll make sure to, to, to leave plenty of time for everyone here to, uh, to ask some questions as well. Um, as Vlad mentioned, Roger has gone through a lot and built companies of very different types. Um, and what I want to be focusing on today mostly is on how you started each of these companies, because you started them pretty much in the same way, which is with search labs. Um, and I think that to many, who, know, who here knows what a search lab is? So you didn't do your homework before you came to the event, I guess, okay. But that's great, so I think that's probably where we want to start today. What's a search lab? Uh, great question, and, and, and first of all, uh, thanks for having me here. Um, this is actually my, uh, my second time at the family, so it's gonna be back. Um, sorry, it started late. Traffic is terrible, as you know. Uh, so, so what is a search lab? Uh, has anybody heard of a search fund? A concept from private equity? Uh, so, so a search fund is a fund where uh, you give you give someone something like thirty or forty million dollars to go basically to go buy a company. So they search for a company to buy, and then when they find one, uh, they go operate it. So if you find somebody who you think is a good CEO, you just give them you give them some cash, and then they go find a business like a chain of restaurants or a chain of hotels or maybe a, a successful SaaS company that you know could be optimized further, something like that. You know, like an online retailer that sells office furniture, and they're the biggest in a certain country. Uh, so, anyway, that 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 that's that's what a search fund is. Um, so you 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 know who the CEO is going to be, and you provide the money, and then the CEO goes and finds a business and purchases it. Um, there's also this concept of uh, of of studios. So any, anybody heard of a studio model for startups? Okay, a couple people. So. Uh, uh, if, if you've heard of uh, Expa, which was founded by Garrett Camp, the founder of Uber, that's, that's one. Um, uh, another example is Atomic, which was founded by Jack Abraham. Atomic raised $150 million to go basically start a lot of different companies. So the model at Atomic is they're spinning off and creating companies. I think Atomic has created uh, 15 companies or so. If you, if, if you, if you go to atomic.co, you can see all the companies they've spun out. So each of those companies has their own cap table, has their own CEO, has their own, their own product idea. So it's an idea factory, basically. Um, a search lab is, is, is kind of in between those. So the idea is uh, you take a CEO, you give them some money, the CEO experiments with ideas like a studio would, and then they go and pursue one. So uh, in our case at Untitled, we raised $3 million um, and we've been experimenting with ideas with a small development team. Uh, when we find one that works, we'll take that and then I will go pursue that full time as CEO. So we're not gonna spin out multiple ideas, we're only gonna end up pursuing one. And so it makes a lot of sense um, now that you've had quite a lot of experience that people would be willing to invest in a search lab led by you because you've had previous successes. I was wondering if you could tell us about the first search lab that you ran um, and how you went about raising the money for that, but also thinking about how you're gonna structure the team, et cetera. Uh, so the first, uh, good question. The first search lab was, uh, was, was the one that I sold to Zynga. So in this case, I had just some personal savings, uh, and I, I had an apartment in Austin, Texas, which was very inexpensive, it was like $500 a month. Uh, and I, I just, I basically ate like ramen noodles and I just, I, I quit my job and just started to, trying to build different Facebook apps. Back then Facebook was so new that it was actually very inexpensive. So uh, you, could, you could launch a new app in something like a week. And we got very fast to the point where we were launching an app every three or four days. Uh, I mean, if it, do, do any of you remember the early Facebook apps like in 2007, 2008? So these are like very simple products. Imagine the internet in the 90s. That's essentially what it was like. Very simple stuff. You know, a simple little game, like tic-tac-toe, you know, something like that. Very, very basic. Uh, so we, we, we'd make a new one again every three to seven days and we'd launch it. Uh, and after about uh, 18 of those, I think it had 18 of them fail and then the 19th one succeeded. Uh, it was a game called Dope Wars where you, you get to deal, deal drugs with your friends. <laughs> um, People liked it. They found it funny, and you know, you could like buy weed and sell it to your friends, and they could buy acid and sell it to you, <laughs> whatever. Um, you know, and and you you earn money and you buy weapons and you create drug cartels. It was it was fun. Essentially, a simple economic simulator. Uh, so people people really liked that, um, and th and that that took off. 
uh, we got to where we were making uh, six or seven thousand dollars a day, uh, which which was which was great. Um, and we didn't we hadn't even incorporated or raised money, so it was just money was all just going directly into our bank account. Uh, and then we ended up selling to Zynga. So so that was I mean I, I think maybe the question behind your question is if you ha if you're not a successful entrepreneur already, how do you fund a search lab? Um, and and again, I didn't fund that one. It was just it was just personal savings and tr testing out very simple projects. I didn't have any employees. It was just me. I had a couple contractors, but I didn't. I paid them very, very low amounts of money. So, you know, you have to be very, very frugal when you're doing it your first time. If you have a little more experience, then you could raise money, five hundred thousand million dollars, and you could actually fund a set of experiments. I think that the best way to do a search lab is if you're able to fund it. So you're essentially retrospectively calling it a search lab, but it was mostly you with your laptop trying to build out stuff. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I ended up doing that for my, for my, my sub subsequent company and then the one after that. So I, it essentially was a search lab. You know, it's one person and some funding that's trying out different ideas. Um, so as we progress, why did you end up uh, selling the company to Zynga? Uh, this was a difficult decision. Uh, you know, th th there's a saying in Silicon Valley, uh, companies, companies aren't sold, they're bought. Um, so in other words, if you're trying to sell your company, somebody doesn't want to buy it because it's, it's less interesting. Uh, so we, we didn't want to sell. Uh, what ended up happening though was I had a co-founder who, kind of, who was kind of helping me out and then he stopped helping me. Uh, you know, after a few months, he, got, he started working on his own projects. So that happened. Uh, we, were spending, we, were, we were having a lot of trouble keeping our servers online. The servers kept crashing because we had so much traffic and I just, I was getting really exhausted from kind of working on it alone. And Zynga made me a very good offer. I ignored their first offer and their second offer and their third offer and it kept getting bigger and bigger. So eventually I said, look, I get to move to California. I get to, uh, you know, I, I, I get some money for this and I, I don't have to work on it alone anymore. And finally they ended up wearing me down and I sold, but I, I, did, I didn't want to sell in the first place. Um, and, and most of the companies that end up selling, again, are entrepreneurs that do not want to sell. And so what did you end up doing at your time at Zynga? Zynga was great. Uh, so I have a few friends who are entrepreneurs who don't want to work for big companies. They think it's a waste of their time. They think they're an entrepreneur and that's better than working at a big company. You can actually learn a lot working at a big company if you work for the right one. If you go work for you know, some old company that's, you know, that, that's not very innovative and you're going to put you into... They're going to put you into a position where you can't really be. You can't really invent anything. That's obviously bad. But when I joined Zynga, they had 30 employees. The next year they had 300. The year after that they had 3,000. So the company grew 10x year over year. And then they then they IPO'd the next year. So it was an incredible experience to be a part of that growth. And I was in an executive leadership position there. So I got to be in the inside circle to see a company grow that quickly. I think Zynga was uh, one of the top, maybe the number two fastest growing revenue company of all time. So if you can get a job at a company like that, that's amazing. Whether you sell them a company or not, even if you get a job like that before you start your own company, it's an incredible learning experience. Uh, for me, it was great because I had this small startup. We were doing about two or three million dollars a year in revenue. You know, Zynga was doing billions a year in revenue uh, by the time I left. So I, I think it was a great learning experience for me. The CEO, the founding team were incredible. Uh, and you know, the other thing that happens when you join a company like that, a startup that's very successful, is uh, everybody wants to meet you. So after I left Zynga, um, since we had just IPO'd, I could get coffee with anyone. And uh, I, I did something like 20 or 30 coffee meetings a week for about nine months. So I, I think I met something like a third of the smart people in Silicon Valley, <laughs> maybe half, you know? So now, anytime I need anything, I just, I know who to call, who to email, who to text. I get a response immediately, you know, whether I wanna raise money, I wanna get a reference on an employee, I wanna hire somebody. Uh, having a network like that's very valuable. And that's what you can get if you work at a successful company. So if you sell to the right person, you know, you end up, you, you, you know, and, and that company ends up being very large then it's, it's very beneficial. And so after Zynga IPO'd, you decided you want to hit the entrepreneurial road again. Um, and you started your second search lab. Um, and I, I was wondering, so that ended up building Gigster. And I was wondering if you could uh, walk us through 
some of the ideas that you thought about uh, before ending up on, on Gigster? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so we used a much more methodical process with, with, with Gigster. Uh, with, with Dope Wars and the Facebook applications, we knew we wanted to make Facebook apps. So, you know, we just built Facebook applications until we found one that worked. With Gigster, um, I had already started doing some angel investing. So I you know, made, made money at Zynga and started investing in local startups in San Francisco, uh, which, which exposed me to a lot of different industries, a lot of different ideas. Uh, you know, I, I, I invested in like, I invested in wearables companies, health, you know, he healthcare companies, personal finance companies, B2B, B2C, everything. So I thought, you know, after Zynga, I, I wanted to really open the aperture and experiment with a lot of different ideas. So we used uh, what, I, what, what I call the, the matrix approach to ideation. So you take, you take the verticals or the industries you find interesting, and those are columns uh, in, in a matrix. So thing, you know, again, things like healthcare, finance, real estate, education, you know, energy, whatever the sectors are you find interesting, those are your columns. And the rows are technologies, artificial intelligence, mobile, web, uh, you know, ma uh, marketplaces, things like that. And then you brainstorm in each cell. So you say, what, is it, what, you know, what does it look like if I do a marketplace for uh, personal fitness? Oh, maybe that's a website where I can find a local personal trainer to help me get fit. Uh, what does it look like if I do AI for personal finance? Oh, maybe that's a, you know, a product that monitors my bills and tells me where I can save money. You know, things like that. So you brainstorm in each cell and you end up coming up with a lot of ideas. Uh, so we, we tried, I think, 15 verticals and about 10, 10, uh, 10 different technologies, 10 horizontals. So 200, what is that, 150 cell matrix, and we had something like four or five ideas in each cell. So nearly 1,000 ideas during the course of that process, and that's over about three or four months. Um, so we were very, very thorough because we, we felt like we could do anything. So we thought, you know, since, since, we, we, since, since we could do anything, we should make sure we go after the best idea. Um, so the, the way we got to Gigster was we were thinking about personal finance um, and we were thinking, okay, well, we like personal finance and we tried, you asked what we tried, we tried some personal finance apps, we tried a fantasy football game for angel investing where you can angel invest using like fake money. Uh, we tried uh, this like experts on demand service where you push a button and you immediately get an expert over video chat. Um, but where we ended up finding Gigster was we thought, okay, well, we like the idea of mint.com because mint.com helps, helps us manage our personal finances, but mint just nags you when you're spending too much money. What if there was an app that could help you earn more money where you just push a button and you get money? <laughs> like that's the ideal app, how would that work? Well, you know, Uber works that way for the drivers. The drivers just get in their car and they start earning money. So we thought, okay, well for us, we're software engineers. So what is an app we can make for software engineers where they earn money? Okay, well, it's probably a marketplace where they have to do programming work. So we thought, okay, well, the problem with Odesk, Elance, Upwork, Freelancer.com, all these websites is that good engineers don't want to work there because you have to bid against these Indian and, you know, South American development shops, you know, and they'll, they'll do work for $10 an hour. You're not going to work for $10 an hour, right? So... We thought, okay, we're going to make a premium, high-end version of Odesk, a website that we would be willing to work for ourselves, where you get paid $100 an hour. So we, we made that. We only attract, we recruited the best people, and uh, we put up a simple landing page that said, hire a quality developer in 10 minutes. And uh, within two days, we had $3 million of business requested. With two days, $3 million of business. So uh, that's when we knew we had a good idea and we shut everything else down and we just pursued that one. The, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the differences in the teams that you're looking to build when you're building the search lab and then when you're starting to grow the company. So if the people that you're looking to hire, say the three, three or four people that you look for when you're building the search lab, if they're at all different from the people that you end up hiring once you start growing the company. So the first three people that you had at Gigster, if they were any different from the first three people that you hired after you'd come up with the idea? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you definitely want very entrepreneurial people. Um, it, it's, 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 it's hard to hire people like that because bringing on an engineer who's willing to work at a, comp work, willing to work at a search lab 
you know, it's like saying, instead of starting your own company, I want you to come start a company with me. You know, so you, you have to find somebody who's basically willing to be a co-founder without, without a co-founder title. And you, you may even give them a co-founder title and then, you know, that, that's, that's okay too. But a lot of these people want to start their own companies. Literally, so for my current company, Untitled Labs, everyone that we've hired, I either had to stop them from starting their own company, I had to, you know, get them to quit their own company, or I had to take somebody, you know, who, uh, who wants to start a company someday and say, hey, work for me first and then you can leave later and, and start a company. So like everybody there, and a lot of them have started companies before, they've sold companies before. So uh, probably four or five people at Untitled Labs are all entrepreneurs. Um, you do want to have very entrepreneurial people er early on. Um, later, you don't need to have people that are that, that are that entrepreneurial. It's just too hard to hire them, uh, and you, you don't really need you don't need everybody to be constantly thinking about what the idea is because it's because it's already determined. Um, so the Gigster story is pretty well documented. Maybe you can run us through it quickly. Um, what I really wanted to focus on, as far as the Gigster story is concerned, is the decision you made at one point uh, to leave and start uh, another another company again. Um, and I was wondering if you could walk us through that process. Um, what made you change your mind? So in the call we had before, you said that your heart was in consumer. Uh, and so I was wondering, given that your heart was in consumer, why you ended up starting Gigster uh, in the first place at all? Uh, and then if you could come to the decision you made to step down as CEO. Uh, yeah, so, so er early on, Gigster was, Gigster was focused on SMBs. Um, and SMBs are more like consumers than enterprises, right? At least in the United States, I think there are, there are 90 million uh, uh, companies. Now this counts all the LLCs, so there's even single member LLCs, uh, things like that. But if, if, I, I think if, if, you, if you ask uh, 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 GoDaddy, so you know, GoDaddy, uh, they, they obviously offer websites for companies. Um, they, they, they have, I think, 30 or 40 million customers in the US alone. And I think uh, the Census Bureau says there's up to 80 or 90 million of these companies. So there, there are a lot of companies in, in, the, uh, in the US. And uh, so, so we were basically selling to these companies, these very small companies. Um, and the sales cycle was very short. So unlike with enterprise, where you might be selling, it might be a three to six month sales cycle. Uh, with SMB, we were closing deals in a single day. So we close a 10 or 20 or 40 or $50,000 deal in 24 hours. Maybe, maybe we close it in three days or four days, but with an SMB, you're dealing directly with the decision maker. You know, you're talking to the founder, owner, CEO, whatever you call it. They're making the purchasing decision. They have the money. So if, if they have an urgent need, if they need development work done quickly, you, you're, you know, they'll, they'll pull the trigger immediately. They'll sign the contract. They'll, they'll wire you the money. Um, so early days, Gigster felt like consumer. Uh, we had a website where you, you could go chat with one of our salespeople, and then during that chat, you could click a button to sign our contract and click a button to pay the deposit. Uh, so we, we were literally closing deals the same day that people would hit the website for five figures. Um, and that felt very fun. You know, those, those deals closed very quickly. It, everything moved very fast. It almost had the speed of Zynga, you know, where people come to a game and they... They, they buy virtual goods within an hour. Um, over time, we started doing larger and larger projects. So we went from doing $20,000 projects to 100,000 to 500,000, and now we do projects in the millions. So we do you know, one to $3 million projects. That's kind of what we aim for. Um, those deals are all with Fortune 500s. So like you know, Exxon Mobil, Nike, Coca-Cola, Google, uh, Johnson & Johnson, these are, all, these are all our customers. The list goes on. We have something like 50 Fortune 500 customers now. And we always knew we'd get to that point because if you, when you look at any B2B market, enterprise is like 90% of the market size. Um, so I think in the case of software development, to $130 billion market, I would guess like 5 billion of that is for small business. The other 125 billion is, you know, these massive projects that are being done by Fortune 500s. So we knew we'd have to go that way, but we thought that we could sell to enterprises the same way that we sold to SMBs, which ended up not being true. So about three or four years in, um, as the company changed, as it became more enterprise sales driven, I realized it had taken on a life of its own and it was no longer like that company that it used to be. Uh, so I, you know, it was less fun for me 
And I started working 40 hours a week. I used to work 80 hours a week, which, which was fun for me. But you know, I started kind of leaving at five every day and starting to think about other projects. And when that starts to happen for me, I, I have to leave and I have to do something else. So it took me about a year to make the decision, but I, but I, ended, up, I ended up leaving. Uh, I'm still on the board of directors. We hired a new CEO. Everything's going fine with the company. Uh, so, you know, if you're ever in a position like that and you think you want to leave, uh, it's okay to do that. You can find another CEO. The company won't die. Um, I, I thought Gigster would die when I left, but Gigster's doing just fine. Um, how long did it go? Did it take you to go from um, realizing that maybe you wanted to move to something else to finding the right person? How did you go about doing that and uh, ultimately leaving? So it, it took about a year for me to decide to leave. Uh, it was about it was early 2017 through early 2018. And then beginning of 2018, I told the board, uh, and we started a CEO search. We, we tried to do a CEO search very quietly without telling the company. So we spent January through March doing a very quiet CEO search. Um, we had one guy we almost hired, and it didn't quite work out with him. So then in March, we announced to the company because we were afraid that the CEO search, something would leak and it would get to the company. We wanted them to hear it from us first. So I made an announcement to the company uh, in March. It was very sad, you know, kind of teary-eyed thing where you tell people you're leaving after five years. Obviously a difficult, uh, difficult moment for everybody. Uh, and, uh, and then we, you know, we formally started a larger search then. The search concluded about six months later. Um, and that's, that's pretty fast, by the way. Uh, I thought the search would take a year. CEO search can take a year. And finding a new CEO, I, by the way, it, it's probably 10 times harder than raising a round of financing. Venture capitalists, angel investors, they'll always give you money, right? It's, it's easy to work with those people, relatively. But finding somebody to come like bet their career on your company is way harder. There are not a lot of good CEO candidates out there. You know, I, probably in Silicon Valley at that time, there were like 20 maybe 50 good CEOs. So we had to get one of those people. It's very hard. Yeah, because what are you looking for? Because it's a bit of a weird stage to have a, a CEO search, right? Because you're post-Series A, um, obviously with a company that's signing big contracts, et cetera, so probably not you know, your average Series A um, or post-Series A company. But still, it's a bit of a weird stage to, to, to be looking for a, C, a CEO. So what were you looking for? What sort of traits were you looking for? Um, and when you say that there are only 20 to 30 people who match that criteria, what were the criteria? Um, well, I, I'll have trouble remembering the whole criteria, but uh, I, I, I will say we wanted, so we, we, we wanted somebody who would have the same passion for the idea that I had had, somebody with a technical background, somebody who had grown a company to at least $100 million in revenue before, because we, we were at about $30 million in revenue at the time. So we wanted somebody who could at least grow us by 3x, somebody who'd managed a team of 100 or more, Uh, and somebody who had a lot of experience working with the kind of enterprises we sell to. So somebody who had that B2B, that enterprise experience, those connections, those relationships. Um, we also believe that partnerships were very important. We like to sell through partners, so we wanted to find a CEO who had experience selling through partners. And not every CEO in B2B has that experience. Some CEOs had, did, had a very outbound motion, particularly with you know, like, uh, low ticket size SaaS is very different. You, have, you basically have a big marketing machine and then you have like an inbound sales machine. And that's not the kind of company that we are. So we needed somebody who was used to the long, long sales cycle consultative process. Uh, so that's what I can remember on criteria. As for the kind of person we're looking for, um, one, one place to look is to go inside enterprises that have entrepreneurial executives that are getting bored. So, you know, we looked at, We looked at competitors like Accenture, Deloitte, BCG, large consulting firms. We looked at uh, you know, large B2B um, enterprise companies that, that had enterprise products. Uh, so companies like you know, Pivotal Labs. Uh, so we, we, we basically looked at people who'd been technology executives you know, who, led, who were leading large teams who might want to leave a big company and start their own new thing. Um, and, and the guy we found, he had actually been an entrepreneur before. He'd sold a company and he'd actually taken a company public. And he was currently an executive at a larger company. So it was kind of a good, a good profile. We got a bit of each side. Um, and so after that, you decided to go for Search Lab 3. 
Um, you mentioned the changes that you had between Search Lab 2 and Search Lab 1. Um, what was different in the way that you've structured Untitled Labs and was different from the previous two? Uh, so so with, with the company before Gigster, we, we actually told people that we were, we, we told people we were pursuing a specific idea. We kind of were a search lab, but we told people, well, if this doesn't work, we'll do something else. Uh, so with, with, with Untitled, I told everybody, look, we are purely a search lab. We do not know what we're doing. We're going to experiment with ideas. You have to be okay with that if you're going to invest. You have to be patient. You have to be ready for us to, to experiment for maybe a year or more. So we got everybody signed up for that. Uh, since it was my third time, I felt a little more confident actually telling everybody that that would be the approach. The second time, I kind of pretended that we had an idea, even though we didn't. Um, so yeah, th this time, I, I just told everybody, look, you're going to have to be patient. Uh, so that, that was a difference. Uh, we raised more money this time. So it was $3 million. I think last time was $1.8. Um, we raised at much better terms, uh, which actually was quite, it was challenging. Uh, we set, it's hard to find the right cap to, ch to choose to raise at. You know, you, you, when you're trying to pick a number, it's like, do I raise at a 5 million valuation or 10 or 15 or 20? Um, we, 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 we picked a very aggressive valuation, which meant that the round took, it took about a month to close. If I had gone with a lower number, I could have closed the thing in like a day or two days because I just knew all the people to go, to go to. I went to Gigster's early investors. I went to other people that I, I already was personal friends with. But I set the number so high that it took them like a few weeks to decide. And it, was, it got very scary. I thought that people would pass. And some people did pass, but we had enough people choose to invest. We actually had about $5 million worth of interest for the three million. But the first two weeks, it was like zero. It was like no interest at all. <laughs> and then one person got interested and then I think somebody else found out they were interested and then kind of everybody got interested all at once. So it went from zero to basically five million of interest. But it could have just been zero. So uh, that was a good learning experience. I think we, we, we did a good job choosing the valuation for the round. Um, we, chose, we chose good investors uh, who, who, are, you know, who, who could help us experiment because we wanted, we wanted people who, you know, VCs who'd been entrepreneurs themselves where I could run an idea by them and they could say, oh, that's a good idea, that's a bad idea, or oh, here's an idea that I would build if I was gonna st go start a company myself. Every VC I met, I always asked them, hey, what are the companies that you wanna start? And I, whoever had the best ideas, those are the people that I wanted to work with. Um, so yeah, the other thing we did was uh, we hired an ops person from day one. So we had somebody covering finance, HR, you know, office management, making sure that, you know, ordering lunch for us every day, stuff like that. Um, so that, that was very helpful. Um, and we have a recruiter also from day one, somebody helping us recruit. Uh, otherwise, we're just, you know, we hired a bunch of engineers. So, uh, you know, I, I think the right way to staff a search lab is maybe one operations person, one contract recruiter, and the rest engineers. So how many of you are there right now? Uh, we have five people right now. Um, and I think we'll grow to something like seven or eight uh, until we find the idea. And then after that, we'll obviously hire for that idea, whatever it is. And is it like the early days of your search labs where everyone's under the same roof, or do you have some people spread out? We have one developer who's in Los Angeles. Uh, that said, I think with a search lab, you want everybody in the same place. It's such a highly creative time you know, where, you know, somebody might have an idea on their way back from the bathroom and they might want to tell you, but maybe if you're on Slack or you're on email with each other, uh, they wouldn't think it's worth sharing. So we, we try to foster an environment where everybody's always, always talking about ideas. We have lunch together every day. We talk about, you know, oh, I read this news article. This thing that Uber's doing is really interesting. What if we tried something like that? Or, you know, oh, my friend started this new company. Uh, you know, it's top secret, but they're doing really, really well, and they discovered this really good, you know, growth hack. Um, so we're constantly sharing information with each other, and we're constantly meeting with our friends for coffee and getting information about what other companies are doing. Uh, and it, it, it helps us. It's very inspiring. So a lot of the ideas that we've had have been based on these really cool kind of secrets that we've heard from other people we know. Uh, and I think it helps to be in specifically in Silicon Valley for that. Because most of the new companies, most of the Intel, the, you know, a lot of things that are happening are in Silicon Valley. 
So whether you can visit, I, I know you guys are obviously based here, but if you can visit there a couple times a year, or if you at least have a friend in Silicon Valley you can do a video call with once a week, once a month, that type of thing is very helpful. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I'd like to relocate our Los Angeles engineer even up to San Francisco, because I think Los Angeles is too far. Um, but you know, everybody has their own philosophy about remote work. I don't think remote work is bad once you get your company set up. Before we open up to questions, I was wondering if you could give us some specifics about the way that the search lab is run. So like, you raised three million, um, how are you deciding to allocate that capital? Are you saying, okay, we're gonna test 10 projects and allocate 300K each? Um, how long do you, how much time do you decide to give to each of these projects? When do you decide when you kill something or when you continue? Uh, great question. Um, and if, if you wanna see a little, if you wanna see kind of a high level on this, you can check out, uh, I, I, did a, I did a post on uh, Medium um, so if, if you go to my, uh, my Twitter, you can find a link to this, this blog post. Uh, but, it, you know, high level, there's kind of five phases. Uh, phase one is brainstorming. So we meet twice a week and we spend one hour and we just brainstorm ideas. Uh, phase two is, is research. So uh, the brainstorms will generate, each brainstorm we generate like 40 or 50 ideas. We immediately throw away like, 90% of them. But then we write down maybe two or three ideas per, per brainstorm that we like. So those go into this like short list of good ideas and then we'll take those and we'll, we'll research some of those. So we'll write, we'll write basically a one page business plan on that idea to say, you know, hey, we, this is, if we were to build this into a big company, here's how it would work. But only one page, we limit ourselves. Um, so, if, if we like the business plan, then the idea goes into phase three, which is, uh, which is prototype. We make a prototype of the idea. We spend something like two to six weeks building a prototype. And it, it's not with the whole team. It could be one or two engineers, maybe even just one engineer building it themselves. Uh, if the prototype is good, we play with it internally. So, you know, me, the other, the, the other kind of co-founders, we maybe let a couple of friends take a look at it. If we think it's good, then we, we move to the launch phase. So with launch, we're doing research to figure out who should we market this to? Uh, one question I like to ask is, who are the 100 people in the world that want this the most? And then I try to provide, I try to provide the product to those 100 people. Because if, if, if you give your prototype to the 100 people who want it the most, and they don't like it, then you know it's a bad idea. <laughs> you, know you, can, you know at that point you can short circuit and move on to something else. Now, uh, so that's launch, is you find those people. Um, then, uh, you know, the, the final phase, phase five, is validation. So that's, okay, you've, you've launched it, it's out there, you put a few more users in and you look, at, you look at different metrics. Look at engagement, retention, monetization, and growth. Roughly in that order. Engagement, I, I always look at engagement first. Are people like using this actively? Retention, okay, do they use it actively for a while? Monetization, are they willing to pay? And growth, you know, okay, they're using it, they're staying, they're paying. Uh, are they inviting their friends? Are, is, is it naturally growing? Uh, or is this the kind of business we have to just buy ads for? In which case, maybe it's not worth starting. Um, so I, I usually look at those four metrics during the validation phase. I think everybody has their own perspective of what, what, what they like to look at. And it depends on the idea too. If you're, if you're a SaaS business, then you're looking at SaaS metrics. You're looking at churn, you're looking at MRR, you're looking at you know, conversion from free to paid trials, you're looking at customer support tickets, blah, 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 right? So everything's a little different, but those core four metrics, I think, are relevant to every business. And so what industries were you deciding to focus on this time, and to the extent that you're able to share, what have you narrowed them down to? So, uh, so we're focused on consumer products, <laughs> only consumer products this time. No, no B2B, nothing that can become B2B. Um, so in thinking about consumer, I guess there's a few angles you could take. The angle we took was, what do people spend the most money on? So at least in the US, the major categories are, uh, are housing, transportation, uh, healthcare, and education, right? Things like that, and food, right? So I think those, those five are, are, are kind of the biggest. So we, we, we looked at those five and we thought, okay, well, food, food is difficult, food is perishable, uh, 
you know, there's already like, inst there's Instacart for groceries and there's Grubhub and there's DoorDash for deliveries. Um, you know, and you know, it's just very expensive. The margins are low. We don't want to do food. Transportation, uh, great industry, but I think we're too late. You know, Uber is doing well. There's this get around in the US. You know, uh, th there's, there's a, already a lot of big companies in transportation that are doing well. Um, healthcare, I don't feel a personal attachment to healthcare, so I didn't want to start a company in healthcare. Um, and education, uh, mar you know, education, the, the market cap of education companies tends to be very low. Um, one thing I like is language learning. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn Arabic right now. I speak, I speak a decent amount of Chinese. I want to learn French someday soon. <laughs> Uh, but you know, look at these companies, and these companies aren't worth anything. You know, there's uh, what's that one? Rosetta Stone is this extremely popular piece of software. Rosetta Stone is like 30 years old, and it's worth like 500 million dollars. You know, so just you know, I mean, 500 million is nice, but it's like for that amount of time, like that's very low value for a company. So we we threw out we threw all those out, and we thought, okay, what's left is housing. So what can we do that's interesting in housing? Um, you know, you, your house, uh, if you own a home, is your largest asset. So we were looking at housing, and we, we looked across housing in a few different areas. There's companies in the U.S. right now that are um, helping you pay your down payment. So there's a company called Zero, Zero Down. Uh, there's a number of companies in that space. There's like five people that do the exact same thing. Uh, there's companies that help you get a mortgage. There's a lot of mortgage companies. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's companies like Open Door, which I'm an investor in, which does... Uh, they basically flip houses, so they buy it. They buy a house. They use some AI to figure out the right price, and they sell it. Um, so there's a lot of companies that are in that space. There's companies that help you rent houses, etc. So we thought, well, one area that people aren't really looking into is is residential construction. So we're like, okay, what what can we do there that's interesting? Um, and we looked at kind of the demand and the supply side, and the supply side in construction is is a total mess right now. Um, at least in the United States, con good, good construction talent is very hard to find. Part of the issue is it takes about 10 years for a general contractor uh, who, who can build, build a house to, to, to learn their trade. It's still an apprenticeship model. It's like learning to be a, a painter in the, in the Renaissance or something. Like You have to work with somebody and learn and all that. So, so we're, you know, and, and also, construction careers aren't popular in the U.S., People don't want to get into construction because they think that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's below them and it's not a career that they should want to do. Uh, so we, we're looking at ideas around construction. How do we make construction a more attractive career for young people? How do we train people to be uh, master craftsmen more quickly? Uh, so so we're, we're looking across that spectrum and trying to find ideas that could be interesting. We don't have a concrete one yet. Cool. Thanks a lot, Roger. And now we'll open up to questions. Uh, Vlad, if Vlad is around, has a sort of flying cube. Yeah, it's, it's a microphone. So you um, can throw it to other people, okay? So who has questions? Sure. One question. Up you here. catch it? Thank you very much. Uh, I have two questions, actually. <clears throat> First question is about the, the fake landing page you did for Geekster, where you acquired like, like, like you did like three million in two days, if I'm correct. So question is, how did you manage to, uh, to attract uh, users on the, f on the first place on this page? Did you, did you do online, uh, uh, online acquisition to, to make that happen? So that's the first question. And second question is, why are you here? Are you looking for uh, collaborating with uh, European talents, or are we too far? Could you, could you say how would you, would you uh, collaborate with uh, European talents? Uh, yeah, so, so for the first question, uh, it was pretty simple. We, we actually posted it on Hacker News and Product Hunt, um, which can be pretty good sites to get, to get traction. Uh, and, you know, we, we ended up, I think we were number one or number two on Hacker News, and same thing on Product Hunt, number one or number two in, in the same day. Um, and we, we got a lot of business through Product Hunt because Product Hunt has a lot of people who are, they're more like product managers. They don't have technical experience. So, you know, they wanted to hire engineers. Um, and the landing page was very simple. It just said, you know, click here to sign up. Tell us the size of your project. So they had to type in a number, like $20,000 is my budget. You know, okay, click here to chat with somebody. Um, and we didn't close $3 million of business. We didn't, you know, we didn't get all that money in two days. But 
uh, we had people tell, tell us that, were, that was their budget and then they ended up getting into the sales funnel essentially. And we closed a decent amount of it. Uh, so that, that was number one. Um, I think that technique kind of still works. And it took us three days to build that landing page. So not something that is really complicated. Uh, as for why I'm here, uh, you know, I, I was visiting Paris and I thought I should stop, stop by. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm not here for business, uh, just, just here for fun, taking a little break. I had this vacation planned for a while. Um, but in terms of collaborating with European talent, uh, I, I've worked with some amazing developers from, uh, Portugal, uh, and from Germany. Uh, I don't know the French ecosystem as well, but, uh, we, you know, we are looking to hire people who are incredible developers always. So, uh, you know, if, if you know any, uh, if you know any developers who want to get in on the next, next big consumer company, I'd, I'd love to meet them. Uh, they'd have to be willing to relocate to the United States at some point, but uh, we do sponsor visas. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, but that, 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 that's not why I'm here. Um, but but I, I do think there's a lot of incredible engineering talent here. I just had a question. So based on wh what do you do about uh, user research? Like how do you conduct it? Do you do it uh, before prototyping or just uh, after launch phase? I, I think it's important to do a little user research before prototyping, uh, you know, but not, not too much. Um, I think you want, you want to develop your own intuition about a problem and about, about, about what the solution should be. I think it's too easy to let your users tell you what direction to go. Um, I think you want to have your own opinion about, uh, about, about a market and about, about what, solutions, what solutions people will want. Um, there's, there's, there's multiple schools of thought on this problem, but a lot of, a lot of companies, you know, it, it's like what they say about the car. If you ask people what they want, you know, they would have wanted like, you know, a horseless carriage, right? Instead of an actual car, you know, so you have, or, or they would have wanted more horses instead of, you know, a, you know, instead of a car. So people, you know, if, if you ask somebody who, who, you know, who has a horse and carriage, hey, what do you want? They're not going to tell you that they want a car because they can't, they, they can't invent that kind of idea themselves. Um, so, so, so I think it's good to ask people what problems they're having. Uh, just ask them more, more general questions about, you know, uh, what are your pain points? What are your problems? But then as far as inventing a solution, uh, you know, we feel like we have to do that ourselves. But do you tell them like, uh, oh, I have this solution. Like, what do you think about it or not? I used to do that. I don't really do that as much anymore. It, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't work too well for me. Um, I, think, I think it's better to develop your own intuition. And, uh, you know, if, if you think that something really will solve a problem, uh, then just launch, launch a simple version and see if people actually use it. You can ask people, certainly, but I, 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 I mean, I've had people say, oh, I love that, I swear I would use that all the time, and then I build it and I give it to them and they use it once and never again. I've had people say they don't want to use something and I build it and then they use it. <laughs> you know, so it, it's just, it's hard, it's hard to do that. I, you know, I, I know it's not a great answer, but you kind of have to develop your own intuition. Oh, thanks. Uh, just another question. Like, if a product is uh, too hard to prototype, I mean, if it takes like, if it's a very complicated product and you need like two months to prototype it, like how do you go with that? I think two months is okay if you have a strong intuition around it. Uh, it's also a question of cost. So uh, if, you know, if something's gonna, if it's gonna take half of your seed round to prototype something, uh, that's, that's, probably too expensive and you want to find a cheaper version. If something's just going to take about two months, I, I don't think that's too bad. Um, there's an idea that we spent about six weeks building, um, six or seven weeks, so call it r roughly two months building it. Uh, I think two months is fine, um, but y you know, if you're spending two months on it, then if you want to work on the company for a year, year and a half, you only have you know, six at-bats. So you, 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 want to, you want to make sure you have a good intuition to spend two months. I would always look at, is there a simpler version you can build? Most people, you know, if I had a whiteboard, I'd, I'd draw this out, but um, there's this notion of, you know, uh, you've heard the term MVP, right? Minimum viable product. So uh, a lot of people, 
you know, focus, some people focus too much on the minimal side and they don't build something that's viable. So they spend like a week on a prototype or two weeks or they just make a landing page. And a landing page in some cases isn't good enough. Your, people really need to get their hands on the product and try it out. Um, so we made this mistake at Gigster, probably with five of the ideas we tried, they were so minimal they weren't even viable. So we just shut them down and we gave up on them. Uh, but they were actually good ideas because later people started those companies and, they raised, and they're worth like a billion dollars. Like five of the ideas we tried at Gigster, we were, our version was too minimal, they're now billion dollar companies. Can you give examples? Uh, Instacart was one. <laughs> we were looking at building an Instacart for, uh, clone. Uh, there's another one that's like, it's like a GitHub for data scientists. So it's a, it's a data store. Uh, there's, I can't think of the others, but um, there, there were like five, literally five companies that like we, we wanted to start. Um, and then, you know, some people focus on making it too viable. So they're worried about being too minimal. So they spend a lot of time and they like add five different features when really they only need one. Um, you know, if, if you're going to err on either side, you should err on the side of being viable. You don't want to err on the side of not being viable. Um, so, yeah, but, but anyways, the, the way I would think of it is pick, pick one feature that you think users really want and make sure to build that very well and try not to add any more features unless they, you absolutely have to for that one major feature. Okay, thank you. Um, how did you evaluate your uh, company without uh, having uh, any uh, validated idea? I'm curious to know. How did we choose evaluation? Um, <laughs> we, we, I, I just picked a number that was the biggest number I thought I could get. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, based on my experience and based on uh, how well Gigster had done and other things like that, I, I picked a number and I told everybody that was the number. And uh, it was funny, this one guy, texted me. He was one of the Gigster investors. He invested uh, about $700,000 into Gigster. So he texted me. He said, Roger, I heard you're raising money. What are you doing? And I said, oh, we're doing such and such. And such. He said, great, I'm in. I said, okay, great. The valuation's going to be blah. And he said, he said, he responded immediately. He said, he said, he said that's ridiculous. Good luck. <laughs> and then, and then I, didn't, I didn't respond to that text message. And then, and then uh, eight days later, he texted me back and he said, okay, I'm in. <laughs> I guess he'd heard from his buddies that they were investing. Okay, so uh, the, um, the, you um, used your network to have uh, some investors, but if you don't have a network and you have uh, an idea and you want to evaluate your, uh, your company, what, uh, what's, uh, what are your uh, advice? Well, every market's different. So you would have to choose a rate that makes sense for, for Paris, if you're raising money here in Paris, based on the local angel investors, the local seed stage VCs in Paris. Um, the way to figure out the number is, uh, so first of all, as a founder, you need to know a lot of other founders. You, you have a connection to the family already. You have people here who can help you price it, who understand uh, what the appropriate kind of market rates are for companies. Um, the, you know. There's a, couple, there's a couple major levers. So one is your experience, your track record. Uh, another is uh, your product. How, what, how advanced is your product? Are you pre-product? Did you build a product? Are you kind of, is it already released? Um, another is your team, the size and the quality and experience of your team. And another is your traction. So how, how many users do you have? How, or do you have any revenue? So those, those, those kind of four things is what investors will look at when they value you. If you have none of that, if you have no background, no team, no product, no traction, uh, then it's very hard to raise any money. As far as valuation, I don't know what you'd get. One million dollars less, I don't know. Um, if you have some of those though, then the number starts to go up. But it, it really all depends on where you are. So let's say you talk to 30 different people that are in a similar stage to you and you figure out what their valuation is. You can pick a number for yourself that fits. You really just have to, you have to ask around. And, and not just for valuation. As a founder, you need to know other founders to, to know other things. Like, oh, like, wh where did you hire your first engineer? Oh, you tried these seven job boards, and five of them were a waste of money, and these two worked very well. Oh, like, where do you buy ads? Oh, I buy ads on Facebook. Oh, I tried Instagram. Instagram's better. You need to be asking around. You have to, you have to constantly be gathering information. From, from everyone around you about everything.
Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I just have a question. Uh, so according to you, having not a clear idea is not a real break to create your own business? Uh, if I understand what you are saying. Uh, yes, th that's, that's, that's the idea behind a search lab, is that you, like, you're the CEO, you're the founder, and you don't have a clear idea, but you want to experiment. So you, you, so you go raise money. Yeah, and, and, and I, I don't know that everybody, you know, I, I think it's, it's a new concept, a search lab. None of you had heard of a search lab before. Um, I, I hope that over time it becomes more popular, more well-known. Because if it becomes more well known, then people with with less experience, less track record, will be able to raise money for it. Any other questions? Yeah. In front. <laughs> Last question. <Good> today. <laughs> Last question for me. Um, I've heard of uh, kind of similar initiatives, not search labs, but some. Uh, some, uh, some labs that want to put together great funding team with corporates, co big corporations, like they cannot really innovate in big corporations, and, and, uh, and, uh, but they have the money, and, and, and the founder, they, they have the talents, and they know how to execute well, but they don't have the money, and like having like a, they have some company in between. What do you think of this kind of initiatives? Do you think it has a future also, or not really? Uh so, 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 so to make sure I understand the initiative, so, so the idea is help, help, help corporates innovate, but basically help build innovation programs for corporates. Yeah, but, but with outsider team, I mean, with entrepreneurs that are not part of these uh, big corporations, and they're like uh, sc scanning some ideas with the big companies, but they make them execute by other uh, teams of entrepreneurs. Okay, but, but the but the the, the money is uh, is uh, is bring by the uh, by the corporation, obviously. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, have you heard of Have you heard of Founders Forum in? London? Yes, a little bit. Okay, so Founders Forum has something called. Uh, they, they 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 have a program like this. I think it's called Founders Intelligence, uh, where they they partner with corporates and they kind of help them. Uh, they help them start businesses. It's kind of like innovation consulting. Um, and I don't know if they use external or internal entrepreneurs. I think it can be external entrepreneurs and they'll, they'll fund those companies. Uh, so I think this is a great idea. Uh, I mean, I, I think corporates have a lot of trouble innovating and like you said, they have money and they want to innovate. Um, something I think somebody should do is build kind of a, I don't know if this exists in Europe, but kind of a startup as a service for, for big corporates. So say, hey, if you give me, you know, if you give us one million dollars, we'll build you a startup. We'll hire the, we'll hire the early team for the startup. We'll help you figure out what the idea is. We'll get it off the ground, uh, and we'll set up a structure where it can succeed internally, where it's separate from your other, from your other teams, etc. Um, they have, you know, a, 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 lo a lot of corporates don't know how to do innovation. Their internal programs don't work. When they work with consultants. That doesn't work because the consultants deliver a report and then that report just dies. Nobody reads it internally. Um, I, I, I think it's a very valuable problem to solve. Uh, and there, there's a lot of work there. I mean, if you think about it, corporates are really the best position to innovate because they already have millions of customers. They already have you know, household brands that are recognized. They have billions of dollars in cash laying around. Um, you know, I, I, I'd like to see a lot more innovation from corporates in the future. It's just uh, for various structural reasons, they have a lot of trouble doing it. So they do need outside help. We have time for one last question, if, one last, if there is one last question. Or two questions, okay, quick questions. Thanks. Thanks, Roger. Um, a question because you made the move from B2B to, from B2E to B2C. Uh, what's your key advice for addressing uh, B2C uh, problems and finding the right solution for B2C? Uh, what's, my, what's my what for? Uh, sorry, uh, your key advice. The key advice. Oh, okay, okay so, sorry. sorry. <laughs> key advice. Uh, you know, uh, so, okay, so, so key advice for addressing consumer problems. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I, I noticed only one person raised their hand when he asked who's doing B2C. Was that you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, and, and, and I made the move from B2B to 
Oh, you made the, the move. Seat. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's Interesting. Why. Most people don't go that way. That's 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 very bold. I think a lot of people. So I didn't. I didn't do that either. I, I went from B to C to B to B and then back. I think going from B to C to B to B is actually makes a lot of sense uh, for those of you who, who want to do that because uh, you can bring B to C innovation and quality and product polish into B to B, which B to B really appreciates. Uh, going from B to B to B to C is definitely bold. <laughs> um, so, 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 so key insight there. Uh, it really so B to C. Uh, I mean, it's it's very divided by kind of what type of product you want to build. So if you want to build a social product or a photo sharing product or something like that, um, you have to use everything that's out there. So you have to spend you know, all day on Instagram and Twitter and Twitch and TikTok and you know, WeChat and WhatsApp. And you have to use all these different products. Um, I, got, I remember uh, one time um, a contact of mine who works in China Actually, he was, he, was a, he was this executive, he was a Microsoft executive, but he has some, had some experience in China. He sent me a deck that WeChat put together. It was like 150 slides about the WeChat product philosophy. It's like one of the best things I've ever seen for a consumer. For, for a consumer. Uh, uh, so if you can share it, I'm interested in. <laughs> okay, I'm, I, if, if I can, I will. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I can, but, uh, but anyways, so if you want to get into social, you know, you have to use all those products. You have to immerse yourself. Uh, and then you'll start over time. It might take you months. You'll start to see a problem or a gap. One example is um, on, uh, on, on Instagram, people are always trying to sell things. You know, they're constantly trying to sell things on, on their Instagram. Well, uh, one idea is what if you made a service that helps you sell things, helps you start your own store on Instagram? Well, I think Instagram's going to do that themselves, but you know, if you had done this two or three years ago, you would have captured that opportunity before somebody else did. Um, you know, uh, eBay is another example. When, when, when PayPal started, they noticed that people needed a way to pay, to pay money to other people, uh, some trusted path. So they launched PayPal and they put links all over eBay. And then uh, essentially they bootstrapped their whole user base on the back of eBay. And they, they uh, ended up building a company they sold for over a billion dollars by literally just sharing links on eBay posts. Um, so you want to get really deep into, into whatever you're doing. I mean, if, if it's marketplaces, then play with eBay, play with uh, you know, Craigslist, play with all the other marketplaces people are using. If it's personal finance, then play with personal finance products like mint.com, et cetera. So just, just spend a lot of time on products, um, make friends with other people who are into consumer, and share critical feedback and ideas. Maybe make a WhatsApp channel or a Slack channel or something and just talk about ideas. And over time, you'll start to see patterns emerge. You'll start, you'll start to see problems. Um, you can also use the, the matrix framework that I was talking about. So I'll, I'll give you an example of, I mean, I have a bunch of ideas I'm not going to use, which I could share. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of one. So, so we really like the company Peloton. Do you know Peloton? OK. So we, we, we were thinking, OK. How can we do Peloton for other things? What's like a Peloton for X? And then we, and then we plugged in everything for X. You know? So what's Peloton for personal finance? What if you had a person who was giving you like stock trading advice? And you could, you could just log in, and there were, they were on video telling you what stocks to buy. And you could up, up, update uh, you know, for day traders. You could upgrade your personal portfolio. We were thinking of a Peloton for weightlifting. So if you could have, you're wearing your like, you know, headset and as you're lifting weights, you could be talking to somebody somewhere who's giving you weightlifting advice. So it's like you're participating in a class, like a silent disco or something. And somebody's kind of whispering in your ear what you should do. Um, so, you know, you, start, you can take successful products and you can try to pattern match those into other industries. But anyways, there's, I have a lot more to say there and, and, and not a lot of time, so. <laughs> but I, I would try, I'd try the matrix approach I mentioned. Last question at the back. Hi, Roger. Uh, quick one. How would you go about minimizing risk to enter a market that is regulated? Which, to elaborate a little bit, which comes with, in my mind, some risk of it's hard to get into the ecosystem and be um, seen as relevant before you get your approval, so it's hard to, to talk with the upper part of the vertical and maybe the down part of the vertical before you get really that rubber stamp from the regulation. 
Can you, can you say the first part of the question again? The, the question is how would you go about entering a regulated market and trying to reduce your risk of execution uh, since getting your rubber stamping can take quite some time. So, I, okay, so how, how would you go about entering a regulated market? Yeah. Um, can you give me, can you tell me what market you're thinking of? For example, the banking market. Banking? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, what? I don't know if you have any experience trying to do this. But. Well, a, a little bit. I'm familiar with, with Plaid in the US and other people that work in the banking market. Um, and also people in, in education, you know, that are trying to start universities. So one approach, I don't know if this works in, in France, but you, you, you can actually buy a bank. You can buy a small bank that's not doing very well. And then you essentially acquire their banking license and their assets. And, you know, you don't have to go through and apply for your own licenses. This is something people do a lot in the U.S. If you want to, if you want to start a university, one of the most popular ways to do it is just to buy a university, and then you get their accreditation status. So you get it in, what, six months instead of five or 10 years is what it would take otherwise. Um, so I think that's, that's one approach. Uh, another approach is, uh, you know, just to get a very, if you're gonna go about it yourself, just, y y you kinda have to know the regulators, maybe not on a first name basis, but you have to get to know uh, how do, they, how do the regulators view risk? You know, what, what, what are the key things that the regulators really care about? And then, you know, when you, when you, when you come to the regulators with, a, uh, you know, with an ask, whatever it is in banking, uh, they, then, then they feel a lot more comfortable. So part of it could be maybe you have an advisor or you have an investor who has government relations or they, uh, they've been in banking so that it, when you apply for whatever you want, they look at your company and they see, oh, well, you know, this guy is, is an advisor and I trust him and I, you know, I'm confident that this company is going to do the right thing. Or you add that person to your board of directors uh, so that they, they, they have some control and, and they can you know, make sure you go the right direction. So that, that's a common path that I've seen is bringing people in at the, at the board or the advisory level um, who, who have those ties. But I, I think in general, you know, I mean, I'll give you an example in, uh, in, in kind of construction, um, you know, construction or real estate. Uh, so I, I, I was looking at buying a building in San Francisco and one of, the, one of their biggest concerns was they wanted, they didn't want the building to feel like it was, it was, a, it was like a 20,000 square foot building, but the regulation says that an individual business can't be larger than 3,000 square feet. Uh, and this is in the Mission District in San Francisco, if you've ever been there. It's very colorful. Every, every little shop, little store looks different. So they don't want some huge company coming in and taking up a whole block. You know, they don't want a big office building there. So when, when I went and talked to the regulator, I said, well, what if, you know, what if we cha change the facade of the building? So the facade makes it look like three or four different buildings, even though it's just the same building. Um, you know, so when you go in and, do, and have a conversation like that, you have a much better chance of getting approval because you understand at a deep level what the regulator really cares about. And, and maybe they can make an exception for you if you're speaking their language. Did you end up being approved? Uh, we ended up, we found out that building had, it had formerly been a gas station, so there was a huge gas tank under it. Uh, and we would have had to jack up the building and remove the gas tank and then clean the soil before we could build anything, which would have cost like $2 million. And the building was six, and we didn't have that much budget. We didn't have an extra $2 million in the budget to just like, you know, environmentally clean the whole soil around the building, so we, we backed out. But, but the technique worked. That was not, that wasn't the yeah, I, I think the technique worked. <laughs> cool, uh, Roger, thanks so much, and please join me in thanking Roger again. Good luck on the